one foot in foreign policy and you know, international relations and all of that. I mean, I still actually do go for a lot of conferences and these global governance seminars and things like that in you know, different parts of the world and all that. Uh, but I think yeah, my passion, as some people put it, is definitely history. And it's, you know, thought I'd be able to do both, but I'm increasingly getting to a stage where uh, you know, I have to choose between one or the other. And I think if it comes to a choice, it will probably have to be books and history. Yeah, I mean, that's a very strange way to look at it. I didn't think of it in terms of, you know, uh, three books. But What's the writing process? How do you go the first it? one was really fairly challenging because uh, that took six years to write. Yeah. And that was a very intense affair. But that was also when I sharpened my research methods. So now, for example, I picked up speed. I know exactly where, how to deal with archives and how to deal with my material. Uh, so then the process becomes easier because you're, you're quicker with your fingers and your mind. So the second book in that sense was, the first book to six years, second book about two years. And this collection, which is my third and newest book, The Courtesan, The Mahatma and The Italian Brahman, this was written over the last three and a half, four years, uh, for various reasons, and it just fired away for a long time. And as publishers started showing an interest in my columns, I said, you know, why columns? I've got slightly longer versions of the original essays that I used to trim down for my columns, I got the long ones. So then we thought we will give uh, a home for these, these essays. Because the idea is, you know, people assume that Indian history is about, uh, this is the way we are taught, five battles, three dynasties, you know, a few kings and five dates. And it, it's a dry as hell, whereas in reality, uh, histories are much richer, complicated subjects. As the title of the book alone suggests, the courtesan, the Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin. Italian Brahmin refers to an Italian who came to Madurai in the 17th century and decided he wanted to convert himself into a Brahmin and he was preaching the Bible as a kind of lost way. He was a colourful figure, walking around in a sannyasi's robe and eating like Brahmins and eating food cooked by Brahmins and he transforms himself into a, a Brahmin, a de facto Brahmin. Uh, the courtesan refers to a multiple, uh, you know, uh, multiple women who really did establish not only reputations for themselves, but the Indian history you get through the eyes of women figures. Why is there no Indian history that, that's written through the eyes of female figures? Why do we always have kings and heroes and battles, but not anything that uh, that tells Indian history through women? And courtesans are very interesting because they were educated, they were creatively inclined, they made direct and immediate uh, cultural contributions to society, whether it's art, music, you know, literature. So uh, there's, you know, one of the courtesans was in the 19th century, she set up a, a company, a private limited drama company, when most South Indian women were still illiterate. She had a company of her own, and she's a great, very successful lady. Uh, another courtesan wrote uh, erotica, or sensuous poetry, in the late 18th century, and, you know, she established a reputation for herself. Uh, Begum Samru, who was a Christian, she started life as a dancing girl in Delhi, and ends up becoming the head of an army marries a German and a, and a Frenchman, has an affair with an Irishman secretary, uh, goes on to become protector of the Mughal emperor and, and an ally of the East India Company and dies one of the richest women in North India. Now that's not the usual trajectory for a courtesan, for a woman who began as a dancing girl. That was quite a remarkable career that she, she carved out and shaped for herself. So these women are very interesting people and they give you a real textured uh, you know, uh, sense of history because history is textured, it is full of these colourful, vivid stories and it's not black and white. And I often give the analogy that far from being black and white, it's actually a mosaic of colours. And all those colours bring different things and the overall effect is just stunning. And I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by thinking history is all these dry dates and a few battles, but in reality it breathes, it's got life and it's got lots of uh, energy and colour. You know, I think when I was fairly young, like in my teens, we'd go to Kerala for our summer vacations. And you know, my grandmother's ancestral place, there, you know, there were stories in every tree, every rock, everything around us. We had a ruined temple in our backyard, two goddesses, and they had legends of their own, our own family goddesses. Uh, there, was, there were groves where we worshipped serpents, there were stories around that. There was a stone where an ancestor sat and cried, and there's a whole story around that, and a love story around my great-great-grandmother. There's a, a jackfruit tree where they say, once a tax man came to, you know, once somebody came with an elephant to cut it, and my one of my ancestors picked up a log of fire and flung it at the elephant. And everywhere there were stories. And I was like, who are these interesting people? They're they're all my ancestors, but they're so much, they're such fascinating, colourful characters. That sort of got me invested in local history, which resulted in my first book, The Ivory Throne, which is about Kerala and uh, tells the history of Travancore in the colonial era through the life of the last female Maharaja. Uh, and the second book is the Deccan, which is my rebel sultans, the Deccan from Kilji to Shivaji. That book is because I grew up in Deccan. 
I grew up in Pune, and I kept wondering everywhere you, you learn about Shivaji and everywhere you learn about the Marathas, but there was history before that. What led to Shivaji? What were the four or five centuries before Shivaji? And it was fascinating, you know, the, the, the sultanates that existed, the kind of exchange of ideas that existed. You have a, a sultan who calls himself, whose name is Ibrahim, but he calls himself son of Saraswati and Ganapati. You have Muslim Shia sultans in Ahmednagar who are actually descended from a converted Brahmin. You have African queens in Ahmednagar at one point. You have the most stunning monuments in Bijapur, in, in Golconda. I was actually at the Golconda tombs when I thought, you know, I really must write a book on the Deccan because why, why is this not part of a, a mainstream imagination of history? So, you know, the, the riches are there, they just need to be found. And I'm happy to be able to be one of those people who's doing the finding. I think it's, you know, there's two, three levels. I mean, research obviously takes its own toll. You're collecting all your information. You're, the integrity has to be pretty high. You have to make sure that your sources are, are all solid and you know, you're on top of the latest academic research, all of that. So then you get a basic structure of the book written first. That's what I do at least. Then comes the other aspect which is the writing. You know, the, the whole idea is to make history appealing to people. Which means it has to be written in an engaging, accessible fashion. It has to be written. A certain amount of storytelling comes into it. Because these stories are fascinating. This dancing girl becoming emperor's protector is just a striking, you know, phenomenal story in its own right. There's plenty for a, a great feature film there. So then you have to invest in the storytelling, make sure that every paragraph, every line, every page is well written so the reader has every incentive to turn the page and they don't get the history or the academic side if it doesn't overwhelm them. That I keep in the footnotes and the notes at the end of the book. This, the narrative itself is supposed to be far more appealing and engaging for as large an audience as possible. Then of course the book gets written. These are very isolating processes when you are doing your research and you are writing. You are not talking to people, you are stuck at your desk for 10 to 12 hours every day. And this can go on for months and months and months. As I said, six years with my first book wasn't. I, I, I lost the first half of my 20s, you know, working in my ex-boss, Rajita Rules Parliamentary Office from 9 to 9, and then lost all my sleep working from 9 to 3 in the morning on my writing. But I had to do it. Uh, you know, so you, know, you have to make time. But then once the book is done, it's fun, because then you have your launch events and your lit fests, and you travel and you talk about the books. So it's, it's actually quite funny. You swing from complete isolation and silence into talkativeness and you know, flamboyant sort of public thing around the book. I'm mostly an extrovert, like I'm not a, a person who's, uh, you know, I have no issues socializing and that sort of thing. I enjoy being around people. So it's been tough around keeping yourself quiet around books then? Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't say tough. It's, it was challenging for me to sort of spend 12 hours a day for months on end yeah. in a library, but I could do it. I mean, the thing is, if something motivates you, you find ways to do it. Yeah. And I was enjoying what I was doing. It was hard work, obviously. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, none of it is easy. But you know, if, you, if you like it and you're driven, then there's nothing can stop you. Really. I started writing that book at the age of 19 yeah. and the 19 year old who went, to, went in writing the book is not the 25 year old who emerged when the book was published. I had changed as a person as well. It taught me a lot of patience. You know, uh, at, at, you know, from the age of uh, 19 is when I started work on it, 20, uh, towards the end of my 20th year, actually in the mid bit, is when I landed up in London and started using the British archives. Before that I had access to the private archives of the, the protagonist of the book and I had the British archives and then over the years different parts and different sources etc etc. It tested my patience, it tested my own personality, but I think I emerged fine out of it. And I emerged with a book that's done very well and you know I'll be proud of for the rest of my life. Well and you know I'll be proud of for the rest of my life. So yeah, so, uh, so the narrative analysis and the evolution of unconventional stories that have, you have put in the book actually. So these are not even from one centuries, they have been multiple centuries and these are actually from columns that you have written in newspapers, I think the Life Moon. Um, not all, but yeah. But yeah. Uh, the Hindustan Times and so Seven, on. Yeah. So yeah, so how do you manage to make sure research about so many people together put in? No, because I mean, I... This is what I do full time. As I said earlier, you know, I decided that I want to focus on my writing and history. So I don't take that lightly. All the time, you know, when I'm in my research cycle, I'm reading constantly, making notes constantly, and discovering these stories. The thing is, a lot of it comes from 
different projects I worked on. So there's an essay of Kunza, who my, who my second book is just a footnote, but here she gets a full essay. Because in the second book there was no space, she, it would have affected the narrative, so I, I, I didn't go into her story in detail, just in passing. You know, her daughter Chandini gets more attention in the second book. But that story was in my mind, I had material on it. So I wrote an essay on her, which is in this book now. Uh, similarly, you know, there's other stuff that comes up in my research, which I don't end up using, but which is with me. And these are, these are still nuggets of history that have great, uh, you know, storytelling value, they can teach us a lot about the past and they can challenge a lot of uh, notions we have about the past as well. And I thought it's worth putting this in a, in a collection and also the idea is also to open history up to new constituency because there are often people at events etc who say they really enjoy you know, listening and they're fascinated by history when it's told like this but they're always intimidated to pick up a big history book because yeah. their experience of history in school was quite bad because history is one of those mark losing subjects and you know it's taught poorly and so on. So that being the case, this, the idea is, you know, you can dip into an essay, read it for five pages, end it. It's over. The essay is over. You can come back to the book whenever you want to open another page, read another chapter. You won't get overwhelmed. And by doing that, my whole agenda or intention here is to slowly draw people into history without overwhelming them with one giant tome. In the hope that once they've enjoyed the book, once they've enjoyed the stories from history that are in the book, the next time they see a big tome on history, they won't hesitate to pick it up because they've already created that, it's generated that interest in history for them. So that's the thing, right? I, I keep thinking that we always have this notion that our ancestors were some sort of constantly thinking noble thoughts, their back was always erect and they were always chanting shlokas and being very pious people all day long. They weren't. We had among us radicals, we had among us people with a sense of humor. Now there's this Maratha king, Shivaji's nephew, who parodies the caste system in, a, in one of the essays that's here. And it's a fascinating story. The Italian Brahman is a fascinating story. Who knew, who knew that in Madurai, in the 17th century, there was such a colorful figure? Uh, so the idea is that our ancestors also, there was a certain cultural confidence that allowed them to laugh at themselves, yeah. to lampoon social conventions, to ask difficult questions, yeah. and to stand up and, and make statements. Whether it's Basava in the 12th century or Fule in the 19th century, you know, these are people with, with a polemical bent, these are people with a, a, a radical mind and they're not, they don't shirk away from asking inconvenient questions. A lot of the women in this book, you know, they ask inconvenient questions as well. Their achievements are often inconvenient for Patreon. So there are people, our, our history is alive with, with characters and people and phenomena like this. But, you know, I think that that's the sort of thing we need to highlight. So the idea is very much to remind people that history is not, uh, you know, boring. It's not about pious people doing sweet things and constantly being noble all the time. No, history, it, it is about human beings. Just like you and I, we are human beings today and we have our flaws, we have our prejudices, we have our emotions, we have our strengths and weaknesses. They did too. They were human beings too. Theirs is also human experience. There's a rich reservoir of human experience in history and that we can learn a lot from. It's a, it's a little parody on social convention and caste. It's called the Sati Dana Suram. It has this Brahmin who's on his way to... Uh, this is Shivaji's nephew, who's the Raja of Tanja Shah. And in the early 18th century, he writes this play where you know, the protagonist is this Brahmin called Moro Bhattu the Magnificent, who's on his way to a temple festival. And on the way, he sees this striking beautiful woman. And he decides, I must have her. And his disciple is like, no, think of your Vedas and your Shastras and all that. He says, no, 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 I don't want that insipid, eternal bliss. I want this bliss uh, of, of a romance with this lady. But when he talks to the lady, she's an untouchable woman. So there's caste that comes into this. And she turns around and she says, Oh no, Dhatma Shastra. And this Brahmin is totally like besotted with her. And he says, Give me your loins like you give a Brahmin a donation and things like that. And at one point she says, uh, uh, I eat, I drink, we drink liquor. Because we're untouchable. We drink liquor, we eat beef. So you shouldn't like have dealings with me. And he turns around and says, We drink cow's milk and we worship the cow. You eat the entire cow, you must be even more pure than me. Now this is the kind of statement if a writer said today, there'd be, I suppose, lots of trouble around it. But the fact is in the 18th century, we still had the cultural confidence where Shivaji's nephew could say something like this. And it, didn't, you know, it wasn't a big deal at all. They had a sense of humor. They had that intelligence and autonomy to be able to do something like this. And these stories tell you that our ancestors were people with minds of their own. Uh, he's the lowest uh, of the low in terms of the caste system. 
and it's interesting where you know some of the other bhakti saints come from relative privilege. They're not fully Brahmins or whatever. They're still not completely though. That gives them a certain amount of freedom or privilege to pack a punch in their in their messages. But uh, this man is the lowest of the low, so he has to be very circumspect about how he presents his arguments. So he's he can't really make blunt statements because he'll have to pay a price. He doesn't have social privilege guarding his uh, him and his his, his you know. And it, it's quite fascinating the way he's always kept at the door. And even when he dies, and they say the story goes that his bones were also chanting God's name, but still they were buried and, and sort of he's memorialized at the gate of the temple, at the entrance of the temple. Even in death, his place is outside the temple, not inside. went hand in hand till about 200 years ago. Yeah. These institutions we've taken for granted today didn't exist. Yeah. If you wanted to be in power, you had to be willing to be fairly violent. And you know, the kind of punishments Indian kings came up with are the most fascinating ones. You know, one of the ways of trial was to have a person dip his hands in boiling oil and if the hand wasn't too burnt or whatever, then you were considered uh, honest. Otherwise, if your hand came out and later it was properly burned and pretty much ruined for life, uh, then you were a criminal. It's hardly justice, but that's one format. Uh, there's this character in Kerala called a historic figure called Velu Tambidalava in the early 19th century. And he, uh, as a rebellion, and one of the rebels, the way he's executed is one leg is tied to one elephant, the other leg is tied to another elephant, and the elephants are made to walk in opposite directions. And elephants, you know, walk slowly. So you can imagine how painful that must have been. Uh, another favorite format that even the British picked up after and, and used very uh, widely, as late as the 1870s they were using it, was to blow people out of cannons, which is not like, they're not stuffed inside cannons or anything, they're tied to the mouth of the cannon and blown to bits. And uh, their argument was in the 1870s, an official said that this is actually a very good form of execution because for the person it's very quick, you know, the head flies in one direction, the legs and arms in different directions. For the person it's very quick, he doesn't know what's happening to him, he dies quickly. But for the person watching, the entire countryside that's watching, you know, imagine bits of flesh and chunks of you know people's like inerts flying around the countryside it's a horrifying spectacle so that was the kind of power uh, that's the kind of you know punishments that they used back in the day because they were all saying if you cross me i'm going to punish you in quite badly Power can shape culture, it can shape, it can shape social institutions, it can shape careers, and it does shape society as a whole. So when we look at our past, when we can talk of rise of empires and kings and you know social dynamics and all of that, but a lot of it revolves around power. What is the, you know even patriarchy, the, the way women are treated, even in something as basic as the family unit, it's about power. It's about controlling who has power over whom. So power is something that really does fascinate me, and power dynamics is something that really fascinates me. And there are so many corollaries. Power, you, having power is not enough, you need legitimacy. So the way kings construct legitimacy for themselves, they invent tradition to, to you know, cement their power. The, the exercise of punishment to sustain that power, the exercise of violence to sustain that power. It's all interesting how all of this at the end of the day links to dynamics of power. Yeah, because you know, I don't think we have this notion that tradition is some timeless thing that's come, you know, untouched from, you know, from the age of our ancestors and all that. It's not true. Tradition is always evolving. Tradition survives by changing. And, you know, tradition is a flexible thing. Yeah. If, it, if it weren't flexible, nothing would survive. Religions are flexible. You know, we, we live in a country where Hinduism is a, a dominant religion, as they say. It's also because it's, it's an extremely malleable uh, religious, you know, collection of religious traditions, really. So, you know, when you need to flex a little bit, it can flex. When you need to bend a little bit, it can bend. It can take different forms and different shapes in different places. That is what gives it life. And now, tradition is not a, a rock you take and put in a box saying this is tradition. Tradition has to breathe, it's organic, it's, it's, it's human. It needs, culture needs to be nourished by other things. Just as you give, you also take. You know? So that's just how it is. grand statements because at the end of the day no historian is completely unbiased because say 
I'm a human being. So even unconsciously, subconsciously, certain biases will show. Everybody wears certain lenses and filters. So you, anybody claiming to be 100% unbiased is lying because it's not possible. You're human beings. A hundred years now, you know, like a uh, hundred years ago, there was no such thing as the feminist perspective of history. But now it is, and it's an important thing. At that time, they didn't even think this was possible. So it's possible that a hundred years from now, they'll look back at our kind of history and they'll say, oh, you guys missed a very important perspective. Maybe it's an LGBT perspective. You never know. So no historian can say that his work is, or her work is like rock solid and this is the best thing out there. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm modest in, in, terms of, in terms of that. But yeah, I think the idea is also that, you know, when history is polarizing, when history is turned into an instrument of vengeance, when it's used to justify political ideologies, and political ideologies always need history to justify and give themselves legitimacy and meaning, and that's going to keep happening. Be that as it may, it's the job of historians to try and present things in context. What matters the most is context, nothing else. The, I mean, we have this thing where colonialism equal to bad, mm -hmm. national struggle equal to good. But history is not about good or bad, it's very complicated and there are so many layers. So it was the colonial state that allowed a lot of Dalit groups and lower caste mm -hmm. communities to actually move up. You know, a, a Fule couldn't go to a tri typical traditional Brahminical school, for example, but he was welcome in a missionary school. That's where he learned English, that's where he picked up literature from around the world. And he, one of his books he dedicated to the people of the United States. Mm -hmm. He was a man who was connected to the world thanks to that. It created spaces, it didn't completely wipe out caste, it's difficult to do that, but it created some level playing ground and created legal protections for castes that were otherwise at the mercy of uh, you know, their caste superiors. So I think the lower caste communities gained a lot uh, from the colonial experience. It wasn't necessarily an evil experience for them. For them, in many ways, it was liberating. And that is important because, you know, we get lost in the romance of nationalism and the freedom struggle and we forget the actual human complexities behind the romance. That's something. That's just one essay where I speculate. You know, but the Mahatma Gandhi once wrote that he uh, wanted to live for 125 years. So this is a speculative essay, you know, wondering whether if he did live for 125 years, how would we have reacted to him, and how would he have reacted to the India that shaped around him? Uh, for example, you know, he would have seen the 62 war. He would have seen the emergency. He would have seen Babri Masjid in the 1990s. You know, how would he have responded to all this? But more importantly, would we continue to have? Would we have continued to venerate him in the way we do? Because he died, it was very convenient to garland him and put him up as the father of the nation. But if he had stayed on, would the people in power have found him a little bit of an inconvenience in the sense that, you know, he didn't believe in the, in the institutions we were forming, he didn't believe in industrialization the way uh, the Nehruvian generation sort of uh, launched it in India. So would he have become a, a little bit of a problem for even for Jinnah? Because he once said that he wanted to go and live the rest of his days in Pakistan. Would Jinnah have had to be, deal with a, an international problem in Gandhiji if he had actually lived? And you know, it's an entirely speculative essay and what ifs are a very uh, tricky territory for anybody dealing with history. But you know, I thought it was interesting to ask those questions. Because those questions tell you a lot about ourselves and how we've evolved as a people. Anisha, the last king of Awadh's mother, she goes thinking that she can negotiate the return of her kingdom with Queen Victoria, only to realize that Victoria has no such power, she's a constitutional monarch. So she's very disheartened and she leaves and she comes to Paris and in Paris she passes away. So she's buried in Paris and a, a friend of mine, she also, one of her sons, was it a grandson, had a Rajput wife who also had a baby daughter born in England and that baby is buried, a baby daughter who died is buried in London at the Kilburn Cemetery. I remember going there and we looked in the coal for an hour and a half of the tomb, the grave, and we couldn't find it. Finally, when we were leaving, you know, there's a path that skirts the entire cemetery. And there, I think we're one more slab on the floor, I can see it in the distance. So I said, might as well check. We've given up after an hour and a half. And, we went and I jumped in the air because it was Umdatul, which is written as Omdutel, but yeah, Umdatul's tomb there. In Paris, similarly, we hiked up this hill, and we, I vaguely knew where it was because there are old drawings of this tomb. But we, we passed this square plinth that was overgrown with weeds, nothing marked on it, nothing written on it. Several times, at one time I think we even sat there, we saw other people sitting there and smoking cigarettes and all that. So it just looked, looked like a regular plinth. Only later we realized that was the tomb of the last Queen of Awadh who was buried in Paris, you know, uh, surrounded by celebrities uh, and Edith Piaf and like a, a bunch of very famous people are, are buried in this particular cemetery. 
And there she was, the last Indian queen of uh, Avat buried in Paris. I think it was it started to change with William Dalrymple because I think he, I mean, Abraham Irali wrote very accessible Indian history. Uh, William Dalrymple really brought a new sense of style into Indian history about 15 years ago. White Peoples was a classic when it was uh, released. Uh, and that is the kind of book I grew up reading with uh, with how this is history told very well. It is a, a narrative art is, is nicely developed and evolved in that book. And now of course it is changing because I think more and more people are getting invested in history. And there is that emphasis on storytelling. The question is it should not compromise on research. Your research has to be, your integrity of your research has to be, has to be present and, and strong. It has to, your research methods have to be, uh, you know, above board and proper. But your writing style can be engaging. So that I think there's hope for the future and more and more people are getting into history. Thank you.